Yeah, so super excited to be here. I think this is my third uh, Berlin Buzzwords. Uh, so looking forward to seeing everybody in person the next time around. Um, so today I'm going to talk about how to measure diversity of your search results. So um, just real quickly, um, you know, I'm one of the co-founders of Open Source Connections, been involved in search for a long time. Uh, steward a couple of open source projects that are around uh, improving search quality and super excited that uh, I joined the uh, Apache Solar PMC this year. So uh, that was a life goal. So, um, so search can be thought of as a struggle, a battle between precision and recall. Recall, for those of you who aren't familiar with these two terms, is a measurement of how well you're returning all the documents that might be about a query. When you focus on recall, you're looking to return more documents about a topic, and you're really expecting many more search results to be returned. This is really common in sort of research use cases or discovery use cases when, you know, you don't really know what you're looking for. And you want to kind of see everything related to a topic. In contrast to that, we have precision. Precision is all about returning a specific document that matches a query, and you want to be really, really accurate. And I think the way- Siri, when is the 2021 Berlin Buzzwords Conference happening? I found this on the web. So I don't know if that audio of Siri, me asking Siri when Berlin Buzzwords came through or not, but as you saw real briefly there, Siri actually found the right web page that had the date that Berlin Buzzwords was happening this week. So like voice search applications, um, a lot of mobile use cases, you're a lot more interested in looking at precision. I'm looking for one great result. And there's a lot of metrics that we can use to understand our search quality on those two axes um, and tools actually that will help you understand them. So for example, uh, I steward Cupid, you can see a link to the GitHub project there, that is an open source project that lets you understand the quality of your search results and then tune them. So here in this video, you can see that I'm rating a set of pretty random documents related to a movie, Star Wars, some documentaries, etc. And, you know, I'm putting a number on it. I'm saying these are not relevant documents. And tools like Cupid let me optimize my query. Here I am tweaking my solar query and I notice that I have a vote count field. And so I'm going to go ahead and boost on my vote count. And this, and then I'm going to do my search. And there we go. I have some better search results. The Force Awakens, the original Star Wars. It's not perfect. There's the Truman Show, but also Rogue One. So, um... However, optimizing just for highly rated documents isn't enough because it focuses too much on just rating, as you kind of saw me doing there, just rating individual documents. And it doesn't take into account uh, the relationships between those documents. In fact, we might be doing our users a disservice by 
returning them, trying to give them exactly what they wanted instead of maybe what they really want. So let's take a segue over to the world of e-commerce search optimization, where I feel like a lot of really interesting innovations in improving search has been taking place. And I think where we can get a lot of valuable lessons for those of us who are maybe more in the research or discovery domains in how to optimize search results. Here is a slide courtesy of Andreas Wagner, founder and CTO of Commerce Experts from his wonderful presentation, Measuring E-Commerce Findability that he gave at Mises a few years ago. And he presented research that they had done on comparing what users are actually clicking on versus what you might predict based on traditional optimized techniques, like what I just showed you Cupid uh, does. This was a really important lesson for me to learn because I am so involved in the Cupid community. When you focus on precision, you would consider the results on the left as much better than the results on the right, correct? That is what uh, using Cupid and rating documents would suggest. On the left are all bicycles, exactly what the user was asking. Whereas when we look at those nine documents on the right, well, it's kind of a mishmash, right? We have bicycles, but we also have clothing, we have accessories, uh, maybe some tools, right? Uh, you know, um, you know the precision isn't as great. However, looking at data analytics, thank you for Andreas for sharing this, right? The results, here are the actual performance results from real users. Yes, the results on the left are technically accurate as maybe an expert, a subject matter expert would rate them, right? A zero to five rating, and we give the ones on the left a five. They're perfect. Whereas the results on the right, we give a two according to expert rating. But when we look at user engagement, the results on the right do much better. A lot more click through, a lot more gross mean value of purchases. And if you take a step back and think about it, it does make intuitive sense to us as humans because we value diversity. We recognize that those results on the left are a sterile monoculture of results. And that while technically accurate, especially if you think the way a machine might think, it's definitely not as good as the ones on the right. The search results on the right not only let me understand what bicycles this website has, but also what are all the products related to bicycling that I might need, like a helmet, like bike pants, and makes the connection to other products I'll need. Now, having said that, I do also want to point out that the example on the right shows some next level search tuning because you notice that they made sure that the three actual bikes showed up at the top, followed by the accessories of the that are related to bicycling, and they show a nice diversity of those products. That is not easy to do. I think the only way they might have improved is if those first three bikes, one had been maybe a mountain bike, one had been a road bike, and maybe one had been a hybrid bike. 
So I think of this as whole page relevancy. When you start looking at the relationships between those individual results and how they contribute to the whole. And you look at this, bad results on the left, better results on the right. So we have an intuitive sense based on research that diversity in our search results is a good thing. However, this begs the question, how do we put a number on diversity of our own search results? We all know that old saw that you can't improve what you can't measure. So the, today in this talk, I'm going to share one very practical approach that I've been using to try and measure the diversity of my search results. First off, I need to introduce the idea of entropy and how we're going to use it to understand diversity of search. In layman's terms, we describe entropy as a measure of uncertainty. More specifically, I am going to show you a variant called Shannon's entropy, which is named after that guy there Claude Shannon, who I recently learned is actually maybe considered one of the, found, the founder of information theory. There's two great links that go very deep into the underlying thinking and math of what is entropy. However, for the purpose of this talk, I'm going to keep it pretty high level and not go into the weeds. I'm gonna take you through the process of measuring diversity is based on the idea that we want our documents that show up above the fold in our search results to not all be from one source, to all look the same, but instead that we want our results to be from many different sources. If all of our documents that are showing up above the fold come from one source, then we have an entropy of zero, i.e. there's no uncertainty. Everything looks the exact same. We know that 100% of the results came from just one source. However, if we have 10 documents from 10 different sources, then we would have an entropy of one, i.e. very significant uncertainty per document. You can't predict each document where it came from because they're all evenly distributed. I sort of, I found this sort of a little confusing. And so I tried to write out a little bit simpler, like want more diversity than you want more uncertainty than you want more entropy, like high entropy good. And then if your search results are very similar, then you know where they're all coming from. So that's very low entropy, low entropy bad. It took me a while to get my head around this because I always sort of thought like entropy, noise in the system, those are bad things. Yet when it comes here to sort of diversity and measuring where our search results are from, which source is providing them. The idea that there is more noise, more entropy is good, uh, took me a little bit to get my head around. So let's see if we can look at this visually um, by looking at some actual search results. So, um, I did a query for Mark Twain on the United States Library of Congress website. And I wanted to understand which documents are being shown above the fold from which formats. What are the original formats of those documents? 
So for those of you who don't know, Mark Twain is the pen name of Samuel Clemens, who was an American writer, humorist, and publisher who lived in the second half of the 19th century and has been considered the father of American literature. He wrote Tom Sawyer, for example. So when I look at these documents here in the original format, uh, it's interesting to note that Mark Twain was a newspaper man. So it sort of makes sense, right? He, was, he worked in newspapers for years writing. So it makes sense that there's a lot of artifacts related to newspapers. But he also wrote books. So it makes sense that, you know, he's mentioned or referenced in various books. But interestingly, in the Library of Congress holdings, there's a lot of other artifacts that Mark Twain is referenced in. For example, uh, he uh, is listed in various maps. There's a Mark Twain National Forest. There's a musical called Mark Twain. So there's a lot of different sources for finding out information about Mark Twain. The other interesting thing is that this website has this strong concept of available all online or all items. But you sort of expect them to pretty much return the same things because online we have 37,000 documents and the total holdings that are related to Mark Twain is 40,000. So I sort of expected in messing around with this um, that I would get the same results by all of the specific formats. So I went ahead and did a search of what was available online, filtering in. And here is the long search results page chopped up to kind of fit in this slide here. And uh, when I look at what's available online, um, it, there's a broad selection of different documents. We have some web pages being returned. We have some books. We have some music. So I'm guessing pretty high diversity of source formats. And now I'd like to go ahead and put a number on it so I can measure. I then thought, okay, well, let me try the other query. Let me look at the all items versus what's available online, just to kind of get a sense of what's the difference, sort of an intuitive sense. And interestingly, I was really surprised. It's all books, individual books being returned. Where did all the web pages go? It's the same query, Mark Twain, and I thought it would be more or less the same data set since one had 37,000, one had 40,000, but my results are very different. I also was a little surprised because if anything, I expected lots of newspapers since that was the most dominant single source format that they had, right? I expected lots of newspapers to show up in here. So we've looked at two different search queries. And let's see if we can use Shannon's entropy to try and understand, put a number on how diverse those set of documents are according to their original format. Here you can see a bit.ly link. You are welcome to go to bit.ly slash measure dash diversity, and you'll get to see the same Google spreadsheet that I'm gonna mess around with. Uh, and we're going to actually look at a little bit of math. So the tab that I'm on is the All Library of Congress Mark Twain search. So what I did here is I went through the first uh, 24 documents that were sort of above the fold, and I classified all of the document sources. So you can see in rank one, it was a book. Two, it was a photo print drawing. Three, it's another book. Four, and so on and so forth, right? And then I aggregated those up in here to my various categories. 
and summed them up. We have 24 documents, term total 24, and then the individual counts. So when you look at this, you can see that in this first one, we got back 20 books, only one web page, and three photo and print drawings. Column E gives you a little bit of a sense of what the ratio of documents are. You can see that we have a preponderance. 83% of our documents were book and printed uh, material. 13% were photos and everything else, 4% one web page and everything else didn't even show up. So columns F and G are some normalization. And eventually in column H, we produce a number, Shannon's entropy, that says how diverse the search results are. With zero being no diversity at all, and the higher the number, the more diverse the search results are. And as you can see, when we looked at all the results, the calculation is 0.78 is our entropy number, which is not very far from zero, meaning these results have almost no entropy, i.e. these results are not diverse at all, when you look at your Mark Twain results through the lens of the original formats of these documents. So if you're a researcher, right, and you're looking at that first 10 results, you're not really getting a sense of what are all the holdings at the Library of Congress related to Mark Twain that might be interesting. Now let's jump to the second tab, available online. The same process, looking through the top 24 results, categorizing them. And already we see, right, photo, print, drawing, another photo, print, web page, photo, web page, more web pages, book. Intuitively, we already know that we're getting a more diverse set of search results based on the original format. Same process as before. We look at our counts and you'll notice, right, again, we have, you know, a close tie between web pages, nine results, photos, 42, or nine results, 38%, photos, 10 results, 42%, and then even annotated music shows up. So none of these categories is a preponderance the way our other algorithm did. And then if we look further over, we see that our entropy number that we're calculating is 1.81, which is a much higher number. It's almost double what we had for the other algorithm. So what this is giving us is a view into diversity, which lets us understand as we maybe do other optimizations, like with tools like Cupid, are we tilting everything to being the exact same result. They all look the same, however, if you wanna do your, your categorization, or are we still preserving the diversity of different types of results that we think is important? Obviously we did it for just one query here, but you could imagine doing it for a whole set of queries and then summing it up to give you that measurement of diversity. So I did want to do one more thing in this talk, which is talk about another really useful thing for, for understanding the diversity of, our, uh, diversity of our search results, which is sometimes called category prediction, which is the idea that sometimes you can use your data to predict a narrowing facet choice. So in this screenshot here, I've done a search for notebooks. And if you look under the product types, we got 193 notebooks. And then we also matched in the processor category, 10 documents, the Chromebook category four. And you can see that if I choose the notebook product type 
category, the notebook product type as a category, if I facet, uh, uh, narrow down on it, I get much better, much more robust search results compared to what I have on the left. So this can be a really powerful technique, but you can't take it blindly. Here's another query for coffee maker. And if you look at this, can we just blindly choose the drip coffee maker because it returned the most? Of course not, because then we would be filtering out, say, pod coffee makers, espresso machines, and all the rest. So I want to go back to this back to the spreadsheet and i want to show one more tab chorus electronics category prediction and this is that same algorithm that we were just looking at but with this introducing this idea of a threshold of how much entropy or how much certainty do i need before I do category prediction. So I've got three queries, notebook, Intel chip, and coffee maker. And I can actually play with this threshold. So if my threshold is the number needs to be above 0 0.70, let's say I make it one, you can see that the facet choice or the category that had the most matches turns green because it's ab above my entropy measure. And maybe I could use that to sort of auto pick that category. Well, let me look at, let me increase that number. Maybe I also, you know, here I have an example for processor, uh, Intel chip query, processor 461 matches in processor, 168 in there. So maybe I wanna also include auto auto do category prediction with this i need to pick a number my threshold has to be higher than my entropy total so let's go with 2.5 but then you can see yes it works for the query intel chip but there's my coffee maker if i go for that aggressive of a threshold then i'm also going to be narrowing on drip coffee maker. So you can use this threshold to find the right number that you know enables the category prediction for the most queries that make sense, but without introducing any you know false matches, false positives. Um, but some may it may not match as well. So I wanted to go ahead and share this as well because uh, I think it's a great technique for if your data supports it, optimize it. So. so thank you very much. I really appreciate the time and I'd love to compare notes. Um, you know, that's why I shared this Google Doc. I'd love to hear what other people are doing around measuring diversity and how they're using it in different ways like category prediction. Uh, I'm active on the relevance Slack group uh, and or send me an email. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thank you, Eric. And um, let's see if we have any, we'll go to the chat and see if we have any questions. What is the class identification of diversity in search results versus screwed up relevancy? Yeah, so that's why we need more than one measurement, right? Like the diversity, you could have amazingly diverse results, right? We can just have a perfect entropy. It's all random results and it's a mess, which is why I use tools like Cupid to be like, okay, these are very diverse, but are they also just terrible results, right? So I need to make sure that I'm still meeting my baseline that they are somewhat relevant documents or very relevant documents. And so that's why I wanted to show sort of tools like Cupid to give you a sense of like, this is good enough and then we can focus on diversity or maybe vice versa. Cool. 
Uh, another popular question is what other measurements for diversity are out there and what are the advantages and disadvantages of entropy in res uh, respect to those? Yeah. So, I mean, I think I would say one advantage of entropy is it's pretty darn simple, right? You all, you know, I was able to put this calculation in a pretty simple spreadsheet and visually have interesting conversations about it. For example, like, oh, that's interesting. This looks very obvious that we should auto, you know, we should pick a threshold where we clearly, you know, if you type in Intel chip, we're going to narrow the processor. Oh, wait, but this is going to negatively impact our coffee maker query, right? I like this one because it's pretty easy to understand without sort of next level data science capabilities. There are a lot of other metrics and a lot of these should be informed by like your click logs and your click analytics. Um, you know, a lot of people building interesting classifiers to do it. Um, I just find this a very approachable technique uh, that anyone can do without a lot of data and without a lot of tool. I find it very useful, especially in sort of the research side of things where you might get a query that's pretty abstract, right? Like someone's name and you're like, I don't really know. There isn't one right answer. You know, if I'm returning thousands of results for your query, how do I even pick the top 10 results? Maybe Click Analytics tells me this is the one document everyone wants. But if I don't know that, then what I really probably should do is aim for a more diverse set of search results so that the user can then start filtering down to what they really want.